Okay. So um, my experience has given me a filter through which I view uh, all the topics that I'm studying, AR, VR, the metaverse. Um, and it consists of really three pretty simple things that we all know are true. Uh, first of all, technology succeeds when it takes what we're already doing and makes it better. So there's no better example than Amazon. Um, people are the killer app. We check our phones 400 times a day because we want that dopamine hit of human connection. And finally, we always overestimate the near term and underestimate the long term. And I would posit that's exactly what is happening with this metaverse concept right now. Uh, my metaverse book, written in 2017, uses the concept of the metaverse as a metaphor. Right? I was putting forward that everything in AR and VR and the putative metaverse, the glue that would hold it all together, um, was a metaphor for the chapters in the book where I connect AR and VR and the world of the uh, emerging spatial computing in 2017. Uh, the word metaverse is a portmanteau. That means it's a combination of two words, meta, above everything, and verse, as in the universe. Uh, there, uh, it was introduced uh, in a 1992 novel, and then it was expanded upon in a much more famous book that, of course, was made into a spectacular movie by Steven Spielberg called Ready Player One. Ready Player One uh, puts forward that there's a video game company that in 2012 introduced something called the Oasis, and it was so popular and so easy to use and so magical that everybody stopped whatever they were doing and homesteaded in the Oasis. So it was rather like the internet in 1995. So we've been talking about the metaverse for quite some time in the world's, uh, rarefied worlds of spatial computing. Uh, and in 2020, well before uh, the announcement that shook the world, from the company formerly known as Facebook, uh, was something I call the Metaverse Manifesto by my friend Matthew Ball, who is a former Amazon Studios strategy executive. And, and he put forward a series of concepts that make up what he called the Metaverse. Similar, not completely the same as the one put forward by Meta. The idea is, of course, that you are fully embodied by an avatar that you exist in an infinite world which can contain an infinite number of other people from all around the world, that there is currency uh, as there is in our world and persistent of space, persistence of spaces and objects uh, and a meta layer that holds everything together. Uh, in early 2021, the metaverse beat was going on Epic Games raises a billion dollars, and they say it is to build the metaverse. They were a little more cagey than Meta has been about what that metaverse exactly is. And then, of course, came uh, the movie uh, come keynote that changed the world. Uh, everybody wants a piece of the meta metaverse, right? And it really is however you want to define it. But let me go with Mark Zuckerberg's definition. It's an embodied internet. Again, you are represented, you are inside of it, embodied as an avatar, and you're present with other people. And you can do things together. Some things, mundane things, like work that we do in the physical world, and some impossible, risky things that you could only do inside of a video game. Meta is all in. I will uh, give them that. They're not, this is not a halfway thing. They're investing $10 billion a year. So in case I wasn't clear, I said $10 billion a year. Um, that's an incredible amount of money. That's the kind of money billionaires spend to get to space every year. I think it freaked out their investors pretty good. Um, they are hiring engineers, the best engineers they can find. They are checking off on every property that they're working on, everything on their um, product list, on their product roadmap. With, for those of you in software, that's the list of things you're still supposed to do. No one ever checks them all off. You only keep redoing the top five. But no, Meta is doing all of them. Um, and they're doing research on the parts of the metaverse that don't exist, which is most of it. The metaverse is a theoretical concept. It does not exist. Uh, it has transformative potential. And of course, that's what's got 
uh, executives and investors and academics like me so excited, but it's a decade or more away. The term has become genericized, right? Everything is the metaverse. So I think we have to be mindful uh, that that's not really accurate. People can say it's the metaverse. My uh, pay to play uh, crypto game is the metaverse. Sure, wh whatever. I mean, let's stipulate that it's all correct. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's all going to end up in a big trough of disillusion. This is the technology hype cycle. Everybody gets excited when the idea is revealed. And then, of course, about a year later, everybody says, what the heck? It's not all that. Who said it was all that? And then, you know, it has to, the technology plods along until it becomes commercialized. And, and in fact, that's what happened to VR. We suffered VR winter. Uh, before the Oculus Quest was introduced because the products that had been so heavily hyped actually sucked. So one day, people stood up and said, hey, you know, this VR thing, it sucks. And trial of disillusion. Um, timing is everything in tech. And, and this is very true about the putative metaverse. I want to tell you a little story about a company that I love, and I love uh, stories about companies. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love following Meta. It's a great story with larger-than-life characters, and the stakes are, I don't know, the future of mankind. How about that for a good story? And General Magic was a similar company filled with visionary engineers in the early 90s. Uh, I was working at AOL. We so admired General Magic. Their vision was so big. They had something called the communicator, which was uh, a smartphone before anybody had a mobile phone. It was an internet device before anybody had an AOL address. So General Magic uh, crashed and burned. They were the first concept IPO. They raised $100 million. That was a lot of money in 1993. And then they disappeared. There's a great movie about it. I highly recommend it. So let's talk a little about VR and AR and the internet. This is kind of getting lost in the whole debate. So let me make this really clear. The internet and VR are, are mutually exclusive. You cannot have the internet, you cannot have the metaverse without VR, and you cannot have VR without the metaverse in any substantial way. So yes, it's going to be cross-platform. Uh, sure, you'll be able to get somewhere on the metaverse with a PC or a mobile phone, but you won't be present there. You won't be inside of it without spatial computing. And that is just a fact. Were it not for Meta, were it not for its ac ac acquisition of Oculus and its introduction of the, uh, the Meta Quest, we would not be here. I would not be talking to you. So um, the Metaverse, what's it made of and what's valuable? What do we really want uh, to see created and what do we want to own? What's important to us? Well, of course, there's this meta layer, right? The HTML and hyperlinks hold the internet together. That's how we navigate. Um, but we don't have the equivalent for spatial computing for us to teleport from one place to the next. And the meta layer, which some people call Web3, that we'll get to that in a minute, uh, which some people call Web3, uh, will supposedly sit on top of the internet. So the internet's not going away, right? It's part of the metaverse. So for example, when I'm in my fully embodied avatar engaged in an activity inside of VR, I want my wallet, I want my costumes, and I want my smartphone to go with me. So the, inter the presence of the internet is persistent and never excluded from the concept of the metaverse. Uh, one other thing that I like talking about, just because nobody is bringing it up, is the spawn point. This is an important concept in video games. The spawn point is the place where you materialize and become present in the video game. So Meta has given this a lot of thought, and uh, they have very rightly uh, arrived at this idea of your home in the metaverse. So when you put on the Quest headset, the first place you materialize is uh, a place that gives you a menu of, of what you can do. But it is a spatial place. You can't really move around in it yet, but Meta has plans to put a home office in there and let you bring in your NFTs and decorate it with JPEGs and I, I don't know, whatever else. Um, 
But the really exciting part of the metaverse is, of course, the thing that it inspires to be and the thing that everybody wants a part of, right? This idea of invisible, wearable, ubiquitous computing that is all around us, that takes education and makes it experiential, that allows a worldwide workforce to be trained, um, that enables e-commerce all over the world, uh, and is also a place for sports and entertainment and live music. And who else is working on the metaverse? Is it just meta? Well, it seems that way at times. Apple has not yet played its hand, and that could have a very significant influence. And of course, the biggest companies in the world are in there slugging away at their little piece, at their little view of the metaverse. But we have yet to bring them together in as a whole. Another final thought on how the metaverse might yet emerge. Video games. Um, Fortnite, 350 million players. Call of Duty, 200 million players. Uh, you know, they're doing social things in Fortnite. You've got Travis Scott uh, performing a concert attended by 47 million people. If they had all paid 10 cents when they walked in the door, they would have made $4.7 million in 10 minutes. That is the metaverse. So the problem is, of course, Having a big M metaverse where everything is connected together is hard. It's really, really, really hard. And so uh, for lots of reasons, I'll, I'll hit them in the next slide, we're going to live for the next dozen years or so inside of a lot of tiny M, small M metaverses, plural. One will belong to Facebook. There are others that are already maturing uh, that I included on that slide. Uh, and why is it going to take so long? Well, for one thing, it's some of the parts of it aren't invented yet. And the infrastructure that you'd need to host millions of people in a simultaneous simulation doesn't exist yet. Uh, the iOS and Android operating systems are not compatible in many significant ways. Uh, there are international borders. Let's get real. The internet that we look at from North America is very different than the internet that people see in China. So two-thirds of the world is looking at an internet that I have never seen. Um, and then, of course, there are the unintended consequences uh, that follow us whenever we enter a new technology. And uh, certainly the fact that Meta is leading this charge is concerning because they have been particularly heedless of unintended consequences. They introduced, for, ex for example, fantastic AI that allowed me to find clothing and shop really easily because it knew me and it knew what I wanted. And I don't think Facebook realized, and certainly most people in the public didn't realize that what could sell you t-shirts could also sell you insane conspiracy theories. So uh, there are many, many unintended consequences that could be potentially unleashed by the metaverse. Now, the, everybody wants a piece of the metaverse, right? I mean, it's the hot new thing. You want to get press. You want to pop your stock. You know, it's the metaverse. I've got a pay-to-play crypto game, the metaverse. I've got cryptocurrency, it's the metaverse. I bought virtual land, I'm in the metaverse. So none of those things is true. And by the way, Web3 is a made up word. Uh, let's talk about 2030. I'm winding things up now and I'm getting to the, so what, why do you care? 2030, 300 million VR devices in the world. That means 300 million devices, not just accessing the metaverse, but giving you presence, a fully embodied presence in that metaverse. And you'll have plenty of choices. There will be thousands of small m metaverses. And meanwhile, all around us in the physical world, things are about to change, right? We're moving from fossil fuels to renewable fuels. Because of uh, the metaverse, or really the internet, um, education is becoming more accessible and free. Uh, work distributed and international. Uh, Big tech companies today, like Meta and Google and Apple, have teams distributed in every country in the world. And those people are collaborating together virtually and being virtually present with one another, even though they'll never meet in the real world. And then, of course, our, uh, we will have, and future generations, will have fewer possessions. They'll have less stuff, and they will replace that stuff with digital stuff and with experiences. Movies will no longer be shown in movie theaters. They will be worlds that we explore. 
And this is part of a general trend of the physical world turning into the digital world. So how do we prepare for the future? Well, one thing I've discovered as an educator is the thing that matters to employers is skills, not degrees. I hope my professors, uh, I hope my supervisors, Chapman, never see this. But really, uh, somebody who learns a game engine in Dubai is going head to head with one of my Chapman students who's learning Unity under me. And they're going to go head to head. And the only thing the employer cares about is how far they got in the Unity education system and how many badges they've earned. I throw out a challenge to my students at the beginning of the semester. If you work on a game engine like Unity or Unreal Engine, five hours a week for 30 weeks, I will get you an $80,000 a year job. So out of 100 students, three have taken me up on it. And I'm happy to say all three of them got hired by the first company I told them to call. Oh, is that the end? I thought I had one more. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening to me, everybody.